So thank you so much for coming tonight to the Lower Columbia chapter of the Ice Age Floods Institute and the Tualatin Historical Society joint meeting. Tonight, we are going to have Bill Bergel speaking on kayaking down the Columbia River, evidence of the Missoula flood from the perspective of the river. Bill has been a speaker several times for us. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Engineering at the University of Michigan in 1971 and his Master in Science in Geology at Idaho State University. He retired from working 42 years in the railroad industry in both engineering and operation positions. He blended his knowledge of rail engineering and operations, plus that of geology, to deal with the continual challenges faced by operating a major railroad. So tonight, he's going to be talking about one of his favorite things to do when he's not working, and that is kayaking. So kayaking down the Columbia River, evidence of the Missoula floods from the perspective of the river. Will you please join me in welcoming Bill Bergall? Okay, thank you, Sylvia. That was a great introduction. And uh, yeah, I do spend a lot of time. And as I mentioned to some of you guys earlier, I do have one of my uh, kayaking companions on, on the screen with us. His name's Ron. So. Uh, He's fished me out of the water a few times. So that's that's good, that's good. Um, but I, I'm gonna go ahead and, and share the screen and uh, come up with the, uh, the slideshow and uh, make, sure, make sure, let me know if you get it okay. Is that working, uh, Sylvia? Looks great. All right, so I'm um, gonna talk about uh, you know, the major conduit through this whole area, um, you know, it's uh, uh, Columbia is, is an amazing river in its own right. Um, and it's been the conduit uh, for uh, the Missoula floods for pretty much its entire length, um, you know, intersecting the uh, um, Missoula floods up by near Spokane, just downstream from Spokane. But um, let's let's just get started here. Um, if I can uh, advance the slides here, I don't know how to do it here. Well, there we go. I am going to start out with a quiz. Um, you guys are, are, are a pretty sophisticated audience, but I did want to uh, point out that um, one of the benefits of the Missoula floods was one of the reasons we became a state, the state of Oregon came much sooner, but um, I'm sure that shouldn't be too difficult, but uh, I did want to bring the, uh, the idea of the Missoula flood is, is really has affected the history of Oregon uh, since its inception back in 1859. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll get to the quiz at the end and, um, and, and the answer, but I just wanted you to start thinking about uh, one of the benefits of the Missoula floods. Uh, this is kind of a history of, of my kayaking of, of the river and basically uh, up in the uh, orange at the top at the Grand Coulee. I didn't do it all at once. I, I've done it on many, many different trips. Um, but basically uh, just these two little thin blue lines are the two areas where I have not kayaked and uh, they are basically on, on a list of things to do, so to speak. Um, and then uh, roughly it's about 600 miles and have gone all the way out to Astoria. Um, it's, it's, a, it's in a very interesting river. It's got a lot of different uh, um, attributes to it and uh, it behaves well in, in, in certain places and it gets pretty ornery in others. Uh, and this is uh, basically, you guys have had Jim O'Connor on, on the program before. Uh, let me go back here. But his quote is, is one I, I thought was pretty uh, apt for this group. Um, the Columbia by itself, its setting is globally um, 
you know, uh, from uh, the worldwide, it's, it's the only continental scale river that transects an active volcanic arc as it drains through the leading edge of a convergent tectonic margin. Uh, and, and that's that's a pretty uh, a stark and in, in, um, awe-inspiring fact to begin with that Jim's come up with. Uh, and then he, he and his uh, field trip uh, guide from last year, he, he says basically you have this uh, uh, setting that pits the magnetic and the tectonic forces of the uh, of, of uh, the you know the uh, the continental margin against the the river the power of the river. Um, and as he says in this quote, uh, in the end, the river usually wins. And so that's that's kind of what um, inspired me to 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 give this talk. Uh, Sylvia asked me quite a while ago to put it together, and and here we go. Um, Nick uh, Zentner gave a talk just this past weekend, um, and I chose uh, I clipped uh, one of the video screens um, just for this this photo here, just to give you some setting. Uh, and Jim talked about the uh, magmatic forces of the of the Columbia River basalt. You see that over on the right of the picture, and you can see probably a former river valley of the Columbia down here, just above Nick's hand. And then here's this. Uh, um, basically a granitic uh, uh, precursor. This was what was here and it's probably buried by this uh, German chocolate cake as Nick refers to the Columbia River basalts. Uh, and basically you can see where it basically peters out and, and it's probably been stripped off the top by the, uh, the forces of the river. But the uh, Columbia River basalts kept shoving the Columbia River to the, to the north. And uh, you can see from this picture uh, that previous uh, photo was taken up here where the star is, the Columbia River basalt kept shoving uh, the river up along this ridge here, and that's where it, it's at, at the present. present. Uh, it used to come down through the uh, Klickitat River down here by uh, Lyle, but uh, by and large, um, the magmatic forces of the subduction or the uh, when the Columbia River basalt spread all over, it just shoved the river out of there. You can see these previous rivers that came through here, um, and they've been all indonated by this uh, basalt. Um, the, we're talking about something that was 16 million years ago, and now I'm going to jump uh, quite a few, about 16 a million years to right now 16,000 years ago when we had the Ice Age um, with the dotted line. Uh, descend down out of Canada. And as you guys all know, it broke uh, or set up on the Purcell lobe. It uh, dammed up the, um, um, the Cork Fork River over by uh, Lake Pend Oreille, Standpoint, Idaho. And basically this area in the blue is what we're gonna study. And this is a um, paper that was written a few years ago that I'm gonna quote from quite a bit. Again, we have the uh, scab lands and we have these different lobes, the Purcell lobe over here, the Okanagan lobe, which is going to be uh, have a big bearing on what we talk about. And then the Puget lobe over by Seattle, Tacoma. But basically, this is the way it, it um, at its greatest extent, the Okanagan lobe extended down through and over and created this area where the dry falls is, is right in this area here. We're not going to talk about that today. But uh, basically, you have this advance uh, where I have one, two, three listed here. And that's pretty much how the, the, the Okanagan lobe advanced. So the Okanagan lobe, excuse me, how the ice sheet advanced. And first, the Purcell lobe came and it, it basically um, uh, dammed the river up here. And uh, the Okanagan lobe wasn't quite here yet. And so what happened was once the uh, Purcell lobe dammed the river, uh, the river uh, then broke um, back around 18,000 years ago or 15,000 uh, you know, uh, years before present. And it, it followed this red line up, up through on the existing uh, route of the, of the Columbia and then down pretty much through here uh, as it went, went down through the uh, um, you know, again, the lobe wasn't here yet, but the, the lobe kept advancing and, and then guess what? It, it basically, um, it, it, um, let me go back once. So, so it was here 
and then the lobe advanced, and then basically this cut down through uh, what they call the Moses Coulee down through here, and then it advanced again uh, to to its um, the 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 most extreme extent of the Okanagan lobe, and then it, basically that's when it cut the Dry Falls and the Telford Scablands, and then the uh, uh, the one over here by the Palouse. So that was the progression of the lobe and it had a great bearing on which route the uh, Missoula floods followed. But the first one, let me go back to that one. That was the most voluminous one. That's the big one that uh, Jim O'Connor talks about as the biggest uh, glacial uh, outburst in the, in the world. Um, so basically these are pictures again from that same paper uh, showing the Okanagan lobe coming down the, the trench here. And then this, all this in purple is uh, the, the orange line is the Columbia that I'm going to be kayaking through in a minute. Uh, but all this purple is the uh, the drift uh, of the uh, of the glacial sheet up and over this. And uh, again, here's another uh, sketch of that. Again, the purple shows the drift, and these uh, black lines are the moraines. And you can see over here uh, the Grand Coulee Dam where the extent of the uh, glacial lobe uh, went in. And so I'm going to put my kayak in just downstream from the Grand Coulee Dam and then uh, boat all this area. There's absolutely no roads along here. It's about 50 miles stretch. Uh, but basically the Okanagan lobe covered the whole thing. So as I said earlier, at first, the first uh, Missoula flood came down the, 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 the main channel of the of the uh, Columbia. And then the second, uh, uh, this is the Moses Cooley right in here is where it, it came down through here. And so the, it extended here and then basically the, the lobe advanced and then it diverted it down through here through, uh, this is dry falls in this area here, as, as you guys all know. Um, again, this just shows uh, the direction of the ice lobe. Uh, coming through here. Uh, that top of that plateau is the Waterville Plateau. It's it's worth a drive for all you guys to head up there and you see these huge uh, boulders everywhere. Again, it's um, it's basically like a big plow on top of that Columbia River basalt and it shoved it uh, round and rounded these boulders and moved them. Basically, these are all kind of rounded because of the, the glacier um, as it entrained them in there. And you can see over here, there's a couple of theories uh, Richard Waite, who works now at the USGS, and then this, these folks uh, have a couple of, basically this is about a mile, and a, or about uh, 4,000 feet up uh, is how high they think the ice was. And, and this other uh, paper back in 83 says the, the, the ice was about a mile and a half uh, thick here, so to speak. And so this is the, the extent of the lobe. And uh, then there's a paper out now too that talks about the weight of this ice and it, the the uh, the isostatic rebound that the glacier had to change the direction of which way the the, the the rivers flowed. But this is basically my kayak trip I put in here um, um, a couple of years ago, right in the middle of COVID, um, and uh, went went down this stretch again. There's no roads here, so you basically have to have your own uh, uh, gear and 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 uh, tent and all that stuff and food and uh i basically put in here the idea was i left a, a bicycle down here at chief joseph dam over here uh downstream at the takeout and then uh, and then i uh, drove up here and put the my uh, kayak in and headed on downstream uh grand coulee dam as you guys know was uh, it's a huge dam it's uh, one of the biggest structures in in uh, north america and uh, the largest producer of hydropower in the U.S. It's about 600 miles from uh, Astoria there is, uh, uh, in terms of river miles. But I put in about um, uh, four miles downstream from uh, Grand Coulee Dam, and you can see this terrace, um, which is talked about uh, quite a bit up in the area there. That's called the Nispelum uh, Terrace, and that's uh, Basically, once the uh, glacier lobe advanced, uh, uh, all this is all glacial till from that uh, glacier there. And then it, when they put the um, 
uh, Grand Coulee Dam near Irwin back in 38. Uh, basically, you can see the granite underneath that uh, Nick uh, Zentner was pointing out earlier. And basically, he, he, that underscores the whole uh, where they, they put the foundations of the dam in that area. But all this well-sorted gravels, um, basically, uh, Irwin called this uh, glacial till that uh, talks about um, you know, where the glacier had been, um, and then it extends all the way downstream, as you'll see in the next few photos. Uh, also along uh, the road here and in, in the river are these uh, huge uh, boulders, uh, and CRB stands for Columbia River Basalt Boulders, which uh, basically caps the skyline here, and it's, um, they're everywhere and they're clumped. And uh, I'll challenge you guys to, to see if you can figure out whether they're um, basically evidence of where, where the, the glacier shoved into a terminal moraine type setting, or did they all get clumped um, after the glacier receded and uh, local drainages deposited them? So I, um, I don't uh, really have a strong uh, sense of what, what actually happened, but you'll see as we go down river, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of these boulder trains. Um, here's a Google Earth image of, of these same boulder trains right in here. And um, you can see the whole area is uh, kind of a glacial outwash um, area. Um, anyway, this is where I put in. Um, uh, not, not too much going here, but a calm day, a little bit of current. Uh, you can see all the, 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 the native material used for the... Uh, for the, 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 just for the launch there. Here's another one of those boulder trains. Um, and then uh, I'm just gonna go quickly downstream here. Um, and I was averaging about uh, with the, uh, with the uh, river, just, uh, it's not advancing all of a sudden. There it goes. Uh, another boulder train down here. And uh, again, uh, uh, Google Earth shot of that, uh, these boulder trains. And that's why I thought, well, they seem to be localized by these drainages. Now, whether, you know, the glacier could have done that too. So, you know, it's uh, trying to figure that out. And then here's uh, the lake bed, so to speak, and these, uh, with the Okanagan lobe extended down across the river and dammed it. And uh, so you're not, you're not gonna see a lot of Missoula flood evidence here. It's mostly the, the damming up of the Columbia River as a lake. Uh, not not all that different than uh, the present day Lake Roosevelt, which was formed by Grand Coulee Dam. So I mean, we're talking about uh, very similar uh, lake in that in that sense, all back and away all the way up into the Canadian border. Uh, again, a lot of fine grain silts, um, pretty much standing high, and then on top is the. Uh, you see the rock, um, the, the uh, Cretaceous tertiary rocks below with the, uh, with the Columbia River basalt up on top here. And that's pretty much uh, this, again, the river's right at the margin. Um, this area was run by uh, a, a guy in a, in a raft back in, um, or a drift boat back in 1924. And he named all these rapids all the way down the river um, and that where this rapid was is if um, you can see this huge uh, slump that uh, basically constrict the flow of the Columbia way back then. And uh, uh, again, more of these boulder trains through here, another photo of them. Um, the, the reservoir is uh, what they call Lake Rufus Woods, and it was created when the dam was completed and fit. 55, and then uh, they raised it about another 10 feet uh, 20 years later. So, you know, there's not there's not a lot of beaches to 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 camp on. I mean, I did find a spot you'll see downstairs. There's a little or down downstream rather. Um, a lot of agro, uh, aquaculture along here, um, and then this is where I was planning to have lunch, but this guy had uh, other ideas, and uh, he shooed me away, so I kept going. A lot of these, uh, again, lake, uh, lake bed uh, settled out. Um, and there's another shot of that from, uh, from the Google Earth. And then I'm down here by the star now. I put in over here and then uh, I was basically making about four or five miles an hour because I had a little bit of current 
because they're producing power. And then you can see the uh, lake beds and then the, probably Missoula fudge or glacial till on top. It's probably a combination of both. Um, there's, there's a close up of that same view, not sorted. So it's probably likely to be a glacial till as opposed to Missoula fudge deposit. Um, again, the top view of that same area. And it's uh, pretty well sorted in, in spots. Um, um, and then they had a lot of these huge drop stones that, uh, again, when you had a, a glacier up above and then it starts melting, it drops these in, into the lake uh, that's formed there. Um, and then they, they set up on top there. Uh, same kind of um, situation happens when these rocks fall out of the ice as it melts and, and they fall into the, uh, the lake bottom. You can see it's uh, very much compressed underneath and then subsequent layers uh, build over the top of that. So they call those drop stones. Um, pretty much, uh, there's quite a bit of them along here. So it's, it's a pretty good uh, place to kayak uh, to, to pick up all this geologic stuff here. Here's another drop stone that's, uh, again, you can see how it fell into the soft uh, sediment and, uh, and then, then subsequent flows build up around it there. Um, you can see the uh, uh, quaternary, tertiary uh, intrusions back there. Uh, you know, again, the, the hard rock as well as the, on top, the uh, Columbia River basalt, and then all this uh, sediment from the, uh, from the lake bed there. Another boulder train there, um, big haystack type boulder from the, now I'm back over here where the star is. So I'm moving downstream pretty good. Um, Nobody out there really, uh, just a couple of boats. Uh, River Ranger came up and talked to me, but that was about it and, uh, going down. Uh, a couple of uh, fine grain beddings with uh, a deposit with an ash layer and some bedding in there. Um, and you've got uh, different flows coming in there uh, as you go down. And you can see the Columbia River basalt above the, uh, the, the hard rock intrusions there below there. Um, this is again some of this uh, Mesozoic, uh, uh, Paleozoic rocks that form the uh, basement rock in this area. Uh, I'm on the next sheet and then uh, basically I, I go another few miles and camp. And I decided to camp uh, on this dock because as I was walking around there, it, uh, there was a rattlesnake that came, uh, um, came looking for me. and. Uh, and then I also put a little barrier there to keep the bears out. So they, they, they kept left me alone that, that night. But um, again, coming downstream, um, this is, uh, oh, this is on the north side of the river. And this is probably this, uh, the landmass that turned the, the Columbia to the, soar, to the south. I mean, you had the, you had the uh, river trying to pinch up against the, the, uh, the country rocks, but then, uh, you know, it, it sooner or later it, it had to turn south and then it's probably right where that happened. Um, more rock, uh, more of this um, kind of almost like a lahar type material. I don't know, Clark, if you had any thoughts about how that got in, implanted there, but you can see the lake beds underneath that and then uh, kind of almost like a slurry or mud flow on top. Here's a close up of that. You can see it's a lot of fine grained sediments that are in, in uh, excuse me. Um, yeah, there, there we go. Uh, basically, it, it's got a lot of class and trained in that. Um, getting close to the uh, Chief Joseph Dam, and this, uh, this is one of the uh, put ins that you can put in and take out uh, just above Chief Joseph Dam. And uh, now I'm getting to the end. So I've, I've just gone 50 miles in two days there. And uh, this is getting over to where the Okanagan Lobe came down Highway 97 from Canada. And it, uh, the one arrow, the one on the, on the right is it's, it's the flow coming towards us. And the other one goes up and over the top of this. And again, it was about another Oh, six, seven hundred feet above that um, ridge uh, on top. And that's that's that Waterville Plateau. And it continued on south of 
oh, a good 50, 60 miles south of that. But this is the uh, dam. This is a um, pretty good sized dam that uh, uh, they put in there just below. And this whole uh, um, lake is what they call the run of the river lake. So there's, they don't hold it for storage. They just use it for um, uh, hydroelectric generation. Um, so basically, uh, it was pretty fast the first day in, in terms of kayak, and I went about twenty, uh, oh, about thirty-two miles, and then I did the the balance the second day. Uh, but they weren't releasing any water the second day, so it was, it was a lot slower. It was only, only averaging about three miles an hour. Um, anyway, so I got out and I basically uh, left my kayak here, and then the uh, kayak or uh, bicycle back to get my car. But this is the Chief Joseph Dam. It's the second largest hydro power producer in, in the world. And uh, basically, there's no fish ladder on this thing. And the reason they didn't put a fish ladder here is they, uh, um, they argued that the Grand Coulee Gant Dam, uh, 50 miles upstream, didn't have one. But So we, we, they didn't have to do one here either. So uh, that's unfortunate because there's two or three pretty good sized tri tributaries that come in uh just above uh, chief joseph dam that could have benefited by the fish runs and then as you can see uh it's 700 miles yet to the source uh, we're only at mile post uh, uh 545 so i mean uh, you know we're not even halfway up the river and yet the you know the u.s uh, folks decided that um you know they paid the Canadians, I think, $15 million for the right to to, um, to cut off their fisheries. But, you know, it'd be one of these days, it'd be good to put these fish ladders back in. Anyway, that's that's my political statement for today. Um, and coming back, uh, you know, it was getting late at night, but uh, this is one of those uh, Columbia River basalt uh, haystacks that are sitting on top of the Waterville Plateau that was... Uh, uh, backlit by the sun as I drove back to camp. And so basically that's this whole area that I, I just did. Uh, um, and I camped here at Bridgeport and the next two days I, I went down to uh, the Wells Dam down here, down by this takeout. So I did the, the rest of that uh, river uh, from there. So I started on down and this is a little town called Brewster. And the uh, if you can imagine the the Okanagan Lobe coming right at us down that valley. And if you head north through there, you, you end up uh, up into, you know, Penticton and Kamloops, that area um, in Kelowna up in Canada is where we're at. And uh, um, this is the town of Brewster. And uh, the, what happens here, just to the left of the picture, the river turns to the south. So right now the river's been heading west and now it's gonna head south the next uh, 200 miles or so. This is looking back um, towards um, where the dam was and the Okanagan Lobe going through there. Um, and then I turned south. Now we're headed due south here and that's a little town called uh, Pateros, I think they say it. And, and this whole area got burnt. Uh, uh, I think it was 2015, they had a huge fire come down the Metal River in the rivers valleys just beyond that great terrace. Again, the terrace was all formed by the uh, by the uh, the Okanagan lobe, and then subsequent flows. Uh, once once the lobe melted, uh, subsequent Missoula, Missoula River flows came down through uh, through there, and then basically took all that uh, terrace material down downstream. Uh, this is what it looks like on top. Uh, Alta Lake is is right there on the Metal River. Um, and that's that's what the terrace is, is all this fine grade stuff. And also just this is this downstream from Pateros, Pateros, um, and that's, uh, uh, I'm, I believe this looks like a terminal moraine. It's, you know, again, you got angular rocks that were just carried along by the flow and then and dumped. Um, and then the, all, this is as far as I got on my, that first trip. I. I basically uh, took out here. Uh, these folks were willing to haul me around, but uh, the wind was forecasted uh, below the next day. So I, I basically terminated the trip and then headed back to Portland. But you can see the, uh, you know, once the 
uh, the terrace, uh, once the glacier was gone, uh, it didn't block the flows of the uh, Missoula floods. And so after it melted about you know, on the third, uh, 13,000 years ago, subsequent flows of the Missoula flood came down here. And you can see it etched that terrace all the way down downstream here. Um, again, this is a, a view of all the dams. There's about, I think, 13 or so dams on the Columbia main stem uh, in the U.S. And then there's several more up in Canada. And then this other river system is the Kootenai River. And then you know about the five or six dams on the, on the Snake River coming out of Idaho. Um, but those are a heavily dammed system um, throughout. Um, and as I uh, got off the river, uh, the wind picked up. It was about 40 mile an hour breezes. And this is the storm or the windstorm that uh, basically uh, started all the fires out by Detroit and uh, up along the Mackenzie River and then down by Talent. Um, this one, um, I, I, I'll go back a couple of pictures here. Uh, this whole town here, Bridgeport, where I was camping right in this campground here, this whole area got uh burnt uh, they they basically saved a lot of the structures in town uh but this is the uh fire that um that burnt that part of the town and they uh there's a town up on top of the hill there that all the farmers and all the ranchers everybody uh went out to to save their town and they were successful in in keeping the, their town from getting uh, burned up and uh, I decided to get the hell out of there. So that's a picture of the, the firestorm in my rearview mirror. So I headed home. Um, so a year later, uh, 2021, uh, Ron, who's on, on the screen here, as well as uh, three or four others of us, uh, put in uh, up here by the Wells Dam. And then we took out down south of Wenatchee. So that was uh, another 60 mile trip we took. Um, uh, kayak along and uh, and camp alongside. Again, we're we're going up to put in uh, there at Wells uh, Dam where I had completed the previous year's trip, and there's a terrace, and you can see the uh, the Chelan complex back over the corner. There it was very windy when we were there, but the current was extremely strong. We had about a Oh, a 20 mile an hour headwind coming at us, and but we had about a seven mile an hour current going downstream. So it was pretty, uh, we had to be on our toes. Uh, but this is the uh, Chelan um, complex. And here the, the Okanagan lobe split into two. One went to the right uh, up to the Chelan, uh, Lake Chelan Valley, and the other one went down the main stem of the Columbia. Um, and I kind of drew some crude arrows that tried to show that, but basically the, the, the lobe split with one, uh, the, uh, the right hand lobe going west up the uh, Chelan Valley, so to speak. Um, and this is uh, the, the lake draining through the Chelan River, um, and that's the uh, Great Terrace up there. Again, it's, uh, you can see it's not sorted. It's basically just uh, uh, shoved up like a bulldozer. Um, this is looking downstream from that same road. You can see the Great Terrace on the other side of the river, the Columbia River basalts up on top. And you can see the, uh, the strand lines from subsequent flows of the Missoula flood that, that have etched the uh, uh, Great Terrace all the way downstream. And we, we get the same kind of uh, boulder trains that come rolling off the uh, Columbia River basalt at the top. Uh, again, some more of those strand lines in the in the in the Grand, uh, Great Terrace. Uh, another shot of the co complex there. Another shot, and this uh, terrace follows all the way downstream, all the way to Wenatchee. It was a pretty impressive structure. Um, but uh, the second day we had very very nice weather to kayak, and uh, you can see the. Um, Unsorted characteristic of, of the of, uh, of the of the glacial rock. Basically, it just dumps it in places, and then subsequent floods have taken away the finds and leaving the, uh, the you know the heavy class behind. Um, a lot of um, if you go up there and camp, we'd recommend this place. There's a place uh, 
several places along the river between uh, Chelan and Wenatchee. Very, very good camping through there in this Daroga State Park we, we stayed at. And they, they've got, uh, this is where a huge eddy uh, basically was uh, formed by a constriction in the river. And so they talk about that. And that's, that's kind of what this, this sign. So a lot of signage as we went along here. Um, not, we're right up against the rock. Again, uh, you know, the Columbia had to, was shoved over here by the Columbia River basalt flows and it ran up against this, uh, you know, very tough rock to erode through. So this is, uh, again, it's that uh, balance of nature that uh, Jim talked about. You know, the river gets uh, shoved around by these magmatic forces, but uh, then they get pinned up against these cliffs. Uh, it's beautiful kayaking through there. Uh, pretty pretty straightforward. And this is some of this uh, Swakane biotite and nice. It was uh, part of a big uh, landslide block in the middle of uh, the Columbia River, a place called uh, Turtle Island, uh, just above this uh, dam um, that's just above Wenatchee. And this is again some of the a very fine grain uh, sorted material that uh, the glacial um, or the, or the uh, river would sort out through there. Not the glacier, this would be a, a Missoula flood type deposit. Um, the river does a pretty good job of sorting. You'd see it goes from very fine grain stuff here to fairly coarse stuff here. So actually this fine grain stuff's not fine at all. It's, it's pretty good. Those are cobbles there. And, uh, and the, and the um, you can see that that's a uh, pretty, uh, pretty good job of sorting by the river. Um, we're south of Wenatchee now, and then this is basically we're headed uh, along the, uh, there's about a 20 mile stretch of the Columbia that um, uh, because of the, the Rock Island Dam, you can't really kayak that. And I was a little uh, upset about that, but um, what I, I've got plans to, to paddle down to the, to the, or paddle up to the dam from a place called Crescent Bar. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, but this is, um, the flood got directed right against this flow here. Um, a lot of you guys know that I'm a railroad person, so I, I was following the, the railroad here, and it, it's got to climb um, a thousand feet to hit Quincy Basin. This is the main line of the BNSF, um, the so-called Great Northern Route, or the High Line, and uh, you know it's got to go up uh, for the next ten miles. These trains average about twenty-five miles an hour up that steep a grade, uh, two percent at ten miles to get them up on top of that. So, plateau there. Um, then we have uh, some localized drainage channels that were carved. Um, um, again, this is probably by that big flood that came through here. And this is again a Google Earth picture of, of this, the first channel. And then this is Mo Moses Coley that's down over here. Um, then you got the dam over here. And all this material was dumped by the by these Missoula flood deposits as we go on downstream uh, rock on dams right there and again this uh, you can imagine this uh, the water was a thousand feet high right through here here's the dam and it was the it you know the just below Wenatchee it opens up like this and so that's what de deposited all these floods or this uh, all this coarse grain material over there I'm pretty sure this dam was uh, uh, you know, it sets up a, a reservoir behind, but it, it's, I, I have to imagine that a lot of that uh, uh, reservoir water seeps through these deposits. Uh, again, that's another shot of the deposits back over there. So they, I don't know that they, I, I have to read about the, the, the building of this dam. This is built in 1933, and this was built about the same time as the uh, uh, Grand Coulee Dam in the same time as the uh, Bonneville Dam. So, you know, all three dams were going in about the same time. Um, but then you can see up here, this is one of these strand lines, uh, probably that, that one flood that came through before the uh, Okanagan Lobe advanced and cut off the river. Um, and another shot of the coulee and then back behind there is, is where we're starting to open up into the Quincy Basin. Um, and around the corner, you get to this place called Crescent Bar and there's, there's absolutely no roads or anything down in there. There's about a 30 mile stretch of the Columbia where there's no, no roads whatsoever. And uh, 
West Bar is over on the on the right hand side of the river. This is a an image uh, showing the river coming down here from the the upper left hand corner, and then it basically it, it opened up here. And these these ripple marks and and uh, and such on West Bar are um, fifty foot high and about five hundred foot in uh, from crest to crest of these these ripple marks. They're some of the biggest in the world. And my thought was to to put in here and then paddle upstream to the dam and, and camp up in this area and, and then spend a day taking a look at these uh, ripple marks there. So, uh, Sylvia, when I do that, and I'll, I'll come and give you guys another talk about West Bar here. But uh, that's another shot of it. So, um, you can see the ripple marks on there and uh, you can you can tell that I mean, this is some of the evidence that Brett's used to, to say that you know this place looks like a big flood came through here and, and yet uh, folks back east who didn't come out and look at the stuff uh, just uh, you know chose to ignore that but you know his evidence I mean it doesn't take uh, a lot of uh, imagination to realize that this, this looks like a big flood came through here um, again another shot of uh, the coulee uh, Frenchman's Coulee way down there. And Nick talks about that. He's got several talks about that. Again, you'd see the, some of the deposits of the Missoula flood right along the river there. Um, now I'm going to jump down to this. Uh, that was up in here where that those last few pictures. I'm going to go down to uh, the star here. And this is a Hanford Reach. And, and a bunch of us, including Ron, did this stretch a few years ago. And this is a fairly famous Lydia Stache is is written about this, and she, her stuff. Um, she's uh, taken a hard look at all the detrital zircons, and her uh, theories are are really uh, uh, exciting right now in the in, in the science of geology. And she's she's basically using this uh, all this uh, here uh, in this blue patch is what they call the Ringgold Formation. And she's finding these tridal zircons that mark uh, where these different rivers came from. And, uh, you know, it, it's basically talks about how the Snake River came out of Yellowstone area and then flowed up through um, kind of Dillon, Montana, and then up through uh, uh, Lolo Pass that way and came around the Rockies uh, in that manner. So all this stuff is all to say this is pretty uh, cutting edge geology that's happening in right, right in this uh, Ringgold uh, formation area. And Steve Rydell and Terry Tolan uh, wrote about it too, and you can see the uh, the ancestral river uh, route of the Columbia back in um, before the all the uh, fold the Yakima fold and thrust belt uh, rose up here recently. And then, as you guys know, the uh, Lake Lewis, which was formed by the, uh, the Missoula floods, that 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 superimposed on top of all that uh, Ringgold formation, and basically that. Lake was formed. It's temporary lake that because of the flood water skin couldn't get through Wallow Gap. But you can see uh, the river uh, is right through Hanford Reach, and so you can see we're going to kayak that in a minute. Um, then the Snake River comes in over on this side. Uh, but this is a guy by the name of Jim, and you can see the ripple marks in the in the back. This is just as we're putting in right there. A uh, place called Vanita Bridge is we're headed downstream, and this is the the type section for Ringgold Formation, and that's the one Lydia talks about quite a bit. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, picking up these tridal zircons uh, for this, basically this um, formation uh, was deposited about seven million years ago, and and uh, for the next three and a half million years ago, it uh, all this lake lake bed sediments were set in here. Uh, all these landslides here are recent uh, because of the, um, you know, in 1960 when they started rerouting the water through Banks Lake and then and irrigating all the central Washington. They didn't have any landslides, but then once that water started to make uh, its return back to the Columbia, all these landslides um, propagated. Uh, good thing is we were able to camp on one of these landslides, so that was good. And um, you can see some of the, uh, you know, the sorting that the that the Missoula floods have taken through here, and uh, just another shot just above uh, Richland there. We paddled on down through Richland, Pasco, the Tri Cities, uh, Kennewick, and this is where the Col uh, Snake River comes into the Columbia. The snake's coming at us, and the Columbia is going from left to right, 
And then uh, we camped that night just up the Snake River a few, a few miles. Uh, this whole area just downstream from where the snake comes in is where the rhyth rhythmites uh, were first identified, the so-called Tushi beds. And if you do the counting, that's where they came up. Uh, Richard Waite came up with the, the 40 uh, flood count uh, that was based on these, these uh, uh, the Tushi beds here. Um, as you know, the count is somewhere between, it's upwards of 40 right now. Um, and then we turned downstream from uh, Mualua River and went down through Mualua Gap. Um, we picked a day that, that we could do it. Uh, we were lucky and uh, we were able to get through the whole thing. You can see that's uh, the whole entire Missoula floods poured right through this uh, uh, gap there, um, scoured out the, uh, basalt uh, to the tune of about 1200 feet through there and uh, this is where we got out of the hat rock um, and then, then and that was the end of that trip and then I took a couple trips down oh uh, basically from the, the John Day Dam downstream down through Rufus and Biggs Junction and uh, got in closer to um, uh, Moody where the, the mouth of the chutes, you can see the uh, floodwaters were clear up here. Uh, um, this ridge top is about a, a 1,200 feet up, and it basically the river was, or the Missoula floods were quite a bit above that and, and just roared down off of, you know, where the, the chutes River came in to, um, to join the Columbia. And then I paddled on down. This was uh, a couple of years ago. I went down through. Uh, uh, as you know, the river bridge or the railroad bridge was built in 1911, and that's right over where Salisle Falls used to be. Um, and here's here's an old picture of that of of the uh, basically the uh, basalt that uh, this is kind of the end of the Wanapum uh, uh, flow down in this area, and basically uh, the the term the dells is a French word that means the gutters. And so the, the first trappers that came through here, the French uh, named it the dells uh, after these gutters that uh, the river kind of formed itself into. Um, then just downstream as I'm kayaking along, you can see Fairbanks Gap, which is a, a fairly major uh, spot. The top of this hill here it's about 1,200 feet high, and the uh, and the bottom of Fairbanks Gap is about 700 feet high, and all the water, or a lot of the water, came pouring down through Fairbanks Gap. And that's that's a good place to. I, I do a lot of field trips in into the gorge, and that's kind of where I, I end my field trips. This is a, a Google Earth picture. Here's Fairbanks Gap, Fairbanks Gap over here. And uh, let me just start out by saying the red line is, is the, basically the route of the uh, Oregon Trail. It climbed up on top of this bluff and then it cut down through, uh, you know, you're, you're basically at sea level here, or basically at uh, lake level, which it's about uh, two, 250 feet above sea level here. And you're up to 700 feet here as you cut through the, uh, the, 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 the water gap here. And then you, uh, excuse me. Um, if I can go back here somewhere. Um, basically, the the Oregon Trail came down through here, and this is called the the Peterson um, uh, route. And then there was an old railroad at, at one time through here as well. A little town called Fairbanks, and you can see just barely there's a there's a little bit of a, a delta that's formed right in here, uh, pretty minor here. Um, but you can see um, a better picture if, you know, if I were to pan out, you would see that uh, the bulk of the water is actually over in this area, over up on top of the, uh, basically this is Glacial Lake Condon. And uh, Glacial Lake Condon was restricted by Rowena uh, Crest downstream from here. And so the Glacial Lake Condon went downstream or down from this picture about three or four miles. And so, you know, as the water would uh, try to force its way through Rowena Crest, it basically had scoured all this. So you can almost imagine that, that uh, there was a lot of flow down through this Fairbanks Gap. And um, if you can take a look at this green arrow here, if you have to look close here, but if you pull up on Google Maps, 
uh, Google Earth, you can see this 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 um, kind of its crease. Well, this is uh, basically about 1140 feet above sea level, and this is how this area is how they dated the the height of this uh, the water level through here. Jim Jim O'Connor and a guy by the name of Gerald Benito um, back in 2003 did all this work uh, to to identify how high the water level was. Again, this is looking back upstream towards the gap from a place called Avery Park on the on the uh, on Washington side. Uh, but you can just imagine the water just roaring down through there. Uh, this is Jim and Benito's work uh, in 2003. They talked about these different stage levels. Um, and you can see the, and this is a, a little, little more of a user friendly one, but you can see the over on the right hand side, you, the, the 1100 foot level uh, right through uh, about where uh, the gap was. And as, as you guys, I'm sure have seen this picture as it gets down to about 400 feet when it finally hits the Portland Basin. A um, lot of sand in the gorge, as you guys know, um, and, and this is a mine that uh, they're using the, the sand for that. Um, and this is getting closer to the Dells Dam. And as um, you know, the, the floodwaters basically strip all the topsoil off the uh, Columbia River basalts um, that, that form the, the gorge. And as you know, it plucked out uh, basins or um, these cult ponds that basically would, uh, you know, uh, just through the hydraulic plucking would, would form these lakes all over the place, or cults as they call them. Um, Jim Chase is uh, a leader uh, of Friends of the Gorge, if you guys are uh, familiar, and he's a self-taught geologist. Um, and uh, yeah, he's leading this group, uh, talks about the, uh, this is an area that Friends of uh, the Gorge have, have purchased this area. It's a beautiful area just uh, on the north side of the river, just uh, east of the Dalles. And this is the boulder train that came off those cliffs. And if you look, get over here, and this is worth the trip here, it's all this patterned ground. And there's a lot of patterned ground all through the uh, Scablands. And, and uh, I'm pretty sure Brett saw all this stuff. Uh, but basically, this is, um, you know, the uh, this is probably Grand Ronde down here. The Wanapum uh, was above it. And the Wanapum was a lot of, uh, the Grand Ronde was a lot of thick layers uh, very voluminous, and so it was a lot more competent rock. The Wanapum was a lot thin, a lot of layers, but they were thinner layers, and so it was easier for the the Missoula floodwaters to pluck those out, and then it would basically it would rip out all of the Wanapum until it got down to the Grand Ronde, and then basically that's as far as it could go. And so you get these beautiful patterns on top of the Grand Ronde basalt. Uh, pretty much all through the Scabland area. Again, we, we talked about Rowena Crest uh, forming the glacial lake Con and behind and, uh, you know, downstream from uh, um, the Crest is, is the town of Lyle. Um, I got, again, the, the whole town was built on uh, the sediments from, um, from um, the, the flood. And then I show the Klickitat River because that's an ancestral site of the Columbia River uh, as it, it flowed through here until such time as the uh, Yakima fold and thrust belt got going about three or four million years ago. And then it basically shoved the uh, river back to the uh, east and all the way over to the Wulu Gap where it is now. But uh, that's, that's a process that's still ongoing, as, as you all know, based on that northwest uh, clockwise rotation. Um, a lot of fine grain uh, basalt, or excuse me, fine grain Missoula deposits there. It's it's uh, Lyle. I show you an empty coal train going back to the Powder River Basin, and we can talk about that anytime. Um, again, you've got the uh, deposits there at Lyle. Uh, Lloyd McKay gave a field trip once, and he took me up and showed me all these um, Missoula flood deposits just above Lyle there. Pretty amazing uh, 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 exposure here. Uh, again, well sorted. You can certainly see the uh, four set beds there. Um, and then, as you guys all know, you, as you get closer, you get the, the effects of the um, 
northwest rotation and the tectonic, uh, the folds and thrusts, uh, or the, the slight folds here at Moser Syncline. And I show you this because, you know, you can see below that uh, uh, yellow arrow, all the soils, the top soils out. So you kind of know how high the water was um, above that is where the trees are and the soil remained. And below that, um, the soil was uh, taken away. Um, here's another patch of, uh, of um, uh, Mozilla flood deposits right, right down at river level. There's a picture of Lloyd. If you guys know Lloyd, he runs the uh, uh, Ice Age Flood Institute chapter there in the Dells. Um, then I happened to be kayaking down through here when the conduit flood was uh, opened up. I just, dumb luck, I was out there and they uh, were letting the water down. There's another picture of Lloyd on a field trip. Now I'll, I'll, I'll end the whole uh, uh, slideshow with this picture. Again, we're blessed with all these waterfalls and, and the flood isn't, didn't necessarily have anything to do with uh, the waterfalls per se, but it did strip away all the uh, loose rock in the, in the gorge and took it downstream. And so it left these cliffs bare, so to speak. And, you know, the uh, falls uh, fell over these, these bare cliffs and, and fell to the, probably a greater depth or the height than, than they might have otherwise. But um, I'll get back to my quiz. And as you guys have probably all figured out, um, you know, why the state of Oregon was really a, a state much sooner than all the other states out west. And it was because uh, the Oregon Trail folks ended up here and getting into this nice valley that had all this nice silt um, that was basically uh, deposited by this glacial Lake Allison here. And um, if Scott Burns is on there, he can tell me how to, how to, 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 um, Scott, as you guys know, is a soil scientist, and he, he probably knows what a patchic, ultic, uh, I can't even say that word. But uh, with that, I'll uh, end it and open it up for questions, Sylvia. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Do appreciate it. And yeah. we all hope that you will uh, join us next month. We also hope that you will join the Tualatin Historical Society that we partner with. And their website is tualatinhistory.org. Or consider joining, uh, especially the Lower Columbia chapter, our chapter, but the joining the Ice Age Floods Institute. Our website is IAF i just like ice age floods institute <laughs> dot org i a f i dot org would love to have you as a member so thank you again for joining us and hope to see you at our next event good night thank you all right thank you thank you, thank you, for you all Bill. Coming. thank you rick thank you bill great job good night bill thank you all right, bye-bye. Bill, Don said, thank you, Bill. Very interesting. That's from Don. All right, thank you, Don. <laughs>